Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us. Let's just give it like one more minute. We had, uh, I think, close to 700 people register for this webinar. So uh, I want to give another minute or two just for people to join us and uh, we'll get started shortly. So, I mean, first of all, we're very excited. I'm very excited to have a, a great guest. I'm really excited to pick your brain and talk about how you're helping me and how you've helped a lot of our clients recently. Um, really exciting stuff you've been working on. Uh, really great opportunities um, you've, you've really helped us uh, uh, with. And thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, and you know what? I, I do a lot of webinars and not often do I get a chance to do all the research and get, you know, a full kind of market update and uh, look at all the different market indicators and data. And this is really exciting because I really had a lot of time to, to prepare for this. And I've been able to pull a lot of really great data that shows just, you know, how great the real estate market is here in Toronto and specifically the condo market. Um, and I think I'm able to, through the data, tell a really telling story of what to expect in 2022. So, um, you know, it's really exciting for me to be able to get all those data pieces, get excited about the market and, and share this information with everyone. So uh, thank you for joining us for that, Adam. Awesome. Again, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, before we get started, I just want to do like some minor housekeeping, guys. This is going to be recorded. So if you can't stick around, don't, uh, you know, don't worry about it. We're going to send a recording of this probably tomorrow, uh, if not Friday. I'm hoping to keep it probably around 40 minutes um, with some Q&A, so maybe within an hour. Um, but again, we'll be sending a recording. So come back or, you know, just log off and you'll get the recording later. Um, but feel free to also stick around with you in Q and a at the end of the session. I've already had a lot of questions emailed to us, um, and through social media. So, um, you know what, let's just on that note, get started. So a quick little, uh, agenda of what we're going to be covering. I'll do a quick introduction of who I am. For those of you who don't know, uh, Adam, who's been kind enough to join us. Uh, we're going to talk about the fundamentals I've used to create a hundred million dollar real estate portfolio and exactly what I mean by that. Uh, we're going to look into my real estate portfolio. It's, a, it's an open book. I'm completely open uh, with sharing everything about it uh, and how I've done it. Uh, we're going to talk about why everyone, in my opinion, should be investing in pre-construction condos. We're going to uh, talk about a Toronto real estate market update. And based on that update, we're going to make some 2022 market predictions. Uh, we're going to talk about why Toronto condos. Uh, Adam's going to talk to us about refinancing to build incredible wealth. He's going to talk to us about how to use equity in your home or investment properties to build wealth. Uh, and he's going to talk about financing multiple investment properties and then uh, refinancing uh, multiple investment properties. And then we'll end with a QA. and a uh, I'm Ryan Coyle. I'm the founder of Connect.ca Realty. Um, I'm also the owner of Marco Property Management, uh, which is our property management division. I've been, you know, fortunate to be involved in uh, many transactions for my clients, helping them make money. And we've, you know, I've got a great team and we've helped Canadians create over a billion dollars of wealth through investing with us. So it's a really exciting number. We're actually getting close to two billion. So I can't wait to get there. Uh, we are the number one Keller Williams team in Canada for written volume, 250 million year to date, uh, 20 plus years experience investing in real estate, 15 plus years as a real estate broker. And my portfolio is 35 plus doors and has a current market value of around 24 million, which I'm going to, I'm really excited to share with you guys. Uh, Adam, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'm a mortgage broker for Dominion Lending Centers based out of Barrie, Ontario, but servicing, uh, quite frankly, all of Ontario uh, and across Canada um, when needed. Um, a large percentage of my clients are, of course, in the in the GTA. Um, I've been doing this for about 18 years, which in my industry uh, means I'm old, and uh, I like to call myself a savvy uh, industry veteran. Uh, very kind of Ryan to use my uh, picture from 18 years ago on this presentation. I, I do appreciate this that. The one you provided, um, like it looks like he's at a party having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have some fun. Um, as well, I've been doing this for, for 16 years now, so wow. You know, I've um, I love what I do, and and um, a, a very large percentage of my clientele are, are are real estate investors. I'm a real estate investor myself, and uh, spend a lot of time helping people plan out their real estate portfolios. It's led to some uh, good volumes, um, 
placing me uh, as one of the top brokers in the country for, for Dominion Lending, which is now the largest mortgage brokerage in North America, actually, not just Canada. And uh, I love uh, I love helping uh, new mortgage agents and just really um, advocating for the mortgage industry in, in general, because I believe uh, working with a mortgage broker is the, the best thing you can do for yourself. Yeah, it's really Thanks good. For having you, Ryan. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been the difference for me working with good brokers over time. Um, just full disclosure, Adam and I have actually, he's never worked with me on my portfolio or refinanced anything yet. And I'm really excited because we're in the process of it, actually a pretty significant refinance in my portfolio. But the reason why I came um, you know, across Adam was my operations manager had a really challenging refinance she was doing and everyone had turned her away. And she's like, someone recommended this Adam guy and he's promised the world and it sounds too good to be, to be true. So let me see what happens if you could actually pull through. And you did, you refinanced it and she was thrilled. So I had some pretty tricky deals for a handful of clients and I sent them all your way and you've financed, I believe, all of them now. And these are deals that like, I can't even believe you did these because the one deal was a buyer who bought two units, uh, Canadian, a uh, new condo closing. They have no Canadian income. Um, they live abroad and you just finance them at, I think, a 75% loan to value, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, we had a client, a very good client of mine. He's probably on this. He just did, uh, he just closed seven units in one building under a holding corp where we couldn't get that financed anywhere. Um, you were able to do that. And I've got a handful of other really good clients who are really happy with what you've been able to do for them. So um, I'm, I'm sorry I put them before me, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be working with you and we'll look again at my, my portfolio and, you know, we could kind of put that in perspective and in, in what you're going to be able to help me achieve by refinancing that. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, okay. We'll just jump right in guys. Again, I'm trying to keep this hopefully below an hour and uh, you know, there's going to be recording and your questions we're, we're looking forward to them. They'll be at the end uh, quickly connect us to realty realty. I was the co-founder of, um, it's uh, primary brokerage for the deals, buying and selling real estate, both resale properties, multi-residential, uh, as well as resale uh, pre-construction properties. Um, Inner Circle is a group of past purchasers where we're able to bring in professionals like Adam and be able to share knowledge together. Marco Toronto is a property management company I acquired in 2019 that uh, really helped me uh, manage my properties because uh, it was becoming a, a lot at a certain point. And then to, to pass on that to my clients, uh, we include free property management for our clients for a period of time. And uh, we've had great success with that company. Uh, One Day Money is a, a private lender where we're able to do a 30-day bridge first mortgage for people who don't want to come up with more money to close pre-construction and want to use their equity. Um, so we've got that as a resource. Uh, jumping into it. So how to create a hundred million dollar real estate portfolio, that number I think is a pretty shocking, staggering number. And uh, just bear with me. I, I'm going to kind of go through why this is a real thing and um, just, you know, how I've done it. Um, so the first thing was a dream. I created a goal for me. It's like you always, always have to start with a goal, whether it's real estate investing or whatever, and really understand the why. And for me, I wanted to create my own pension. I grew up in a family full of teachers. They would brag about two things, their summers off and their pension plans. And I knew at a young age, I wanted to be a, an entrepreneur and, you know, I wanted to be a real estate investor. Um, and I didn't have a pension. So I knew I wanted to create my own pension. And, and before even buying my first property, I had a goal of buying 10 properties, um, which is obviously uh, I've surpassed. And, you know, now it's more about creating multi-generational wealth to be able to pass down to, to different generations in my family. And that's really what gets me excited about this. And, you know, once you have that and the why to get excited, you're going to start from the end and you're going to work backwards. I, I can't tell you how important that is. You know, you figure out what you want. Is it 10 condos? is it 20 and you say okay what do i need to go do do now to to get started and to to actually get there and you create a plan and then you take action you know an action a plan without action is is just a dream um you know action is just actually doing it and it's it's not complicated um what i did was i found people who have done it before me they you know and then they i learned from them and then i didn't reinvent the wheel and 
you know, I think after um, meeting Adam and, and me, if you haven't already, that uh, I think it's just it shows that it's really important to work with the team who has done what you want to do and, and achieve the goals you want to achieve. So leverage, compound interest, refinance and repeat. These are really the, the fundamentals, the foundation of my portfolio. And, you know, pre-construction is the ultimate leverage. It allows you to invest without a mortgage. So, you know, when you go and buy a pre-construction condo, you're putting down a deposit on a highly leveraged piece of paper that you're tucking away in your filing and cabinet and not even doing anything or taking out, opening that filing cabinet for another four or five years. And you're putting down incremental deposits. Typically they range from, you know, anywhere from five to 15%. I think 15% is the most common, but they're usually in 5% increments. So a $500,000 condo price, uh, you're probably putting down 25,000, 30 days, 25,000, and, you know, maybe 180 days, 25,000, maybe in two years, it's always spread out. So the, the leverage on that is significant and you don't need a mortgage. And, you know, that's really what's allowed me to buy as many properties as I have is because I've been able to buy pre-construction that is staggered. And I use the equity from this one to close that one and so on and so forth. Um, by the time you take out a mortgage, you have price and a rent uh, and rent appreciation outperforming the market, which you'll get into. Um, and creating serious equity. So, you know, time is your friend with real estate. It eliminates risk. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't fully eliminate it, but it really reduces risk. Uh, real estate over the long term has outperformed any other asset class. Uh, it's always gone up over the long term. So, by putting down a piece of paper today, you're not buying the condo. When you actually go and get the mortgage in five, four, five, six years and buy the condo, you've got all of this rent appreciation and capital appreciation. And that's what puts you in a really comfortable position as an investor because you have instant equity that allows you to really reinvest and redeploy the money. Um, and then other people's money. So OPM, it's a pretty you know uh, investor type uh, acronym. Uh, buy with the developer's money and then buy with the bank's money and have your tenant pay it. And the great thing about that is, you know, if you're cash flow positive, for example, $100, $200 a month, whatever the number is, there's also a large payment that Adam will talk about later that is then paid down on your mortgage. So eventually you're mortgage free. And that's why real estate over the long term uh, is going to do uh, very well for everyone. And then just continuing that compound interest is interest on interest. It really adds fuel to the fire. Um, you know, if you have a half a million dollar condo this year, it goes up a hundred thousand. You've got a six hundred thousand uh, dollar condo that goes up. You know, again ten percent. Then you've got an extra, you know, interest on six hundred and ten instead of five hundred. So, you know, that that might be slow incremental growth, but when you compound that additionally by buying multiple properties. Um, I mean, this is really what uh, Albert Einstein, I think, is talking about. Uh, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. The, apologize. Sorry. Is the eighth wonder of the world. He, under, he who understands it earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. And I don't know if he was talking specifically about an investment, but I think compound interest in anything, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a law of the universe that it just uh, growth happens and things eventually become very... Um, you know, abundant, I think. So equity in your property isn't working for you if it's sitting there. You need to make it work hard. And this is what Adam's going to really get into with us. And what I mean by that is a lot of people, I have conversations about this all the time, and a lot of people don't even realize that they're sitting on a, a, a mountain of cash in their primary residence. If you've lived at your home for a number of years, there's a very good chance that it is appreciated a lot. And there is a way to refinance it that allows you to take money out actually as a tax deduction that allows you to then reinvest that money and, 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 and invest in real estate. And for me, that's how I started. Uh, that's really the fuel that fueled my entire portfolio and excited to talk about that more. Um, and then th this is like the best thing about refinancing. And if you have anything to add at any point, Adam, please, please yeah. do. But it's an incredible tax deferral. So it's, it's the number one tax deferral on the planet to ever exist as far as I'm considered. So what that means is, for an example, you are going to refinance my portfolio. And I'm hoping to pull out, um, you know, probably over a million dollars in the next 12 months. Uh, probably can 
a lot more than a million dollars, and I'm not going to pay any tax on that today. So that means I've got over a million dollars to redeploy in other investments, a cottage, whatever I want to do, and defer that tax until I sell the property, whether that's in one year or 100 years. And this is like one of the biggest secrets of being able to build wealth. I used to sell condos um, and then use that money to buy more. I'll show you my, my, my portfolio that that was a mistake. And uh, that's the reason why, because after you pay a capital gain or, um, you know, sometimes even income, then you're left with less money in your pocket than actually refinancing most of the time. And depending on what you're going to use those funds for, Ryan, if you use them for what you use them for, you get what I call the double whammy because in Canada, if you um, use, for example, a home equity line of credit, funds from a home equity line of credit to purchase a real estate investment, the interest paid on that home equity line of credit is personally tax deductible. We're not even talking about the tax deferral you just mentioned, but the interest on that line of credit because you used it to buy an investment property is now tax deductible against your personal taxable income. Um, yeah. And that, for a lot of people in a high tax bracket, that's an amazing tool. For sure. That was actually my next point. So you've got the two strong tax incentives there as a tax deferral, and then it lowers your taxable income. For me, I'm constantly refinancing, so I've got a ton of leverage in my, my portfolio, but um, it's also lowering my taxable income, but giving me money to, to, to you know create and compound and buy more properties. So it's, it's just an incredible thing. And once you have a number of properties and you're doing on a number of properties, that's when you really see the magic work. Um, and then, so for, for this type of investing, it's, it's short-term investing versus long-term and sorry, sorry, it's long-term investing versus short-term investing. Um, you know, I know maybe some people have made a lot of money in Bitcoin. I, I hear people are making tons of money and then they're losing it. I don't really know how it all works. So I invest in real estate, but you know, this isn't a, a quick and sexy way of making millions overnight. Uh, but in my opinion, it's the safest, most lucrative way to building incredible, massive amounts of wealth over time. Uh, it's very predictable. It's very risk adverse um, and it's very lucrative. And, you know, I, I'll take it back to an example. I remember and, and it's leverage. I mean, leverage is a big component to that. Right. So you can't really do that with other types of investing. I remember buying my first stocks. I was 20 years old. I bought Nortel. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows the Nortel story. Um, but I actually leveraged, I was in college and they allowed me to leverage and I bought $20,000 of Nortel stock. And what I didn't realize was that, uh, they did a margin call because it was just getting hammered. And I probably went to class that day and didn't look at my computer and then everything was gone. I lost everything. <laughs> it was just gone. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, leverage is, is very open, um, extended very easily to, to real estate. I don't know about any other investment types that it really is. And if it is, it's extremely risky. So how to create a hundred million dollar portfolio income while you sleep. Passive income has, has been something that has been ingrained in my mind since a young young boy my grandfather i remember used to always tell me sitting on his front porch he lived next to me you know he'd always be like create passive income that's income while you sleep and then he would go even further well i'll get to that point after so so what i mean by passive income is essentially when you have a an investment or some sort of instrument that is creating income for you where there is minimal to no effort uh, involved with doing it and and real estate is the easiest passive income uh, that I can think of, especially pre-construction, because, you know, that's your filing cabinet working really hard for you and you're not doing anything for a long period of time. And then we're going to be managing your property, hopefully, if you're working with us. So $54,000 was the average salary in Canada in 2021. I'm just trying to make a point with real estate as passive income and why multiple properties can, can really go so far. Um, the average condo price, which we'll get into in Toronto currently, uh, in downtown Toronto, 743000 It's up 16.5% year over year. So it's $122,000 in annual appreciation alone. That's almost, that's over twice the amount of the average Canadian salary. And that's the perfect example of passive income because whoever had a condo last year that was, you know, 700000 roughly, they, they, they made over $100,000 uh, or their net worth increased over $100,000. And then multiple streams of income. So, you know, if passive income is easy. Why not do it multiple times? And, 
you know, I, I remember my grandfather was like real estate. It's so easy. Earn money while you sleep, have your tenant pay your mortgage. And that was really what, uh, you know, really probably led me down this path was him just ingraining that in my mind. And, and, and when you can create multiple streams of passive income, it just allows you to do a lot more and create a lot more wealth. So we, uh, we kind of coined this uh, trademark, this term, the multiplier effect, which was always that, you know, we bought one property, we'd refinance, use the, the equity from that to go buy multiple properties. And with the goal of mine originally being 10 properties within 12 years or 15 years, you've got about 10 properties that has, you know, the Toronto market's been very good to me and that number's considerably higher, but that's kind of the, the, the thought behind that. Some people call it the snowball effect and that's just compound interest and leverage and everything just kind of working that eventually, you know, it kind of happens slowly. And then you get to that like 10, 12 year mark and you've got a few million in your portfolio you can pull out and, you know, just kind of double down. So that's, that's the way it works. And then, you know, I think this is a very fitting quote. I love it. If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you'll work until you die. It's a little, little dark. And I'm sure Warren Buffett will work until he dies, even though he's got all kinds of uh, passive income. But um, I think it's just a really important point. You, you don't want to be, you know, it, it, people are retiring later in life in Canada right now. It's unfortunate. Um, pension plans are at all time lows. Um, and I think real estate is the way, if you get ahead of that, where it's going to supplement uh, the most, hopefully a lot of Canadians retirements. So just to, um, get this kind of emotion and, and Adam, this is one of the properties you're going to be doing. So this is originally going to be done with RBC. Uh, so I do have the appraised value, but what happened was RBC looked at my holding corp owning this property and, and determined it was a, uh, even though they're already holding the first mortgage, they determined it was an operating company, um, which we might get into because buying under a corporation is a real huge advantage. Um, and it's a holding corp, uh, is the advantage not the operating corp. Um, so, so what happened here is I bought this unit, uh, 602,000 in April, 2017, uh, about five years ago, I guess, just under five years, the appraised value today is 1.175. It's a tremendous amount of growth. Current rent is 3,500 per month. The current mortgage on it's 482,000. If I refinance that today at the appraised value at 80% loan to value, I will get $940,000. This is the bottom. Um, be good if I had a pointer here. Can you see my mouse? I can, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so that'll show me paying off that mortgage. And then I'm left with 457000 uh, from that one property in five years, which is remarkable. Um, you know, it was obviously a really good opportunity. Um, but that's the math that happens over time. That's a five-year refinance. That's what the Toronto market's been doing for the last, you know, 45 years on average. And, uh, I've been really fortunate. So, um, you know, the nice thing about this is this will not, I will not pay tax. That money will go into my bank account and I'll reinvest that. And, uh, uh, uh timely, but CTV just had a, uh, online, uh, article today uh predicting with uh in 2022 capital appreciation will average out in canada an additional 10 percent, and obviously in major markets so everyone's been worried have we hit the ceiling have we hit the ceiling we're not even remotely close to hitting the ceiling um our chief economist um at dominion lending always points to the fact that actually around the world toronto is still undervalued yeah as a as a as a, as a major city um, it's a very, um, beautiful, safe, amazing city. And we're, we're nowhere close to this, you know, ceiling that some people like to talk about around the dinner table. Yeah. Um, that's an amazing example. What a, that's a beauty refi. I feel bad for RBC. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've got a few more, so it's all good. Uh, and then this is just a quick snapshot and illustration we created to show the multiplier effect. I mean, this is something I created years ago, and it just really highlights the compounding, the leverage, and kind of what we're trying to achieve here with, um, you know, theory, just buying one condo and turning that into, you know, in this example, um, six condos. And, you know, this example, which is a little old, $450,000 condo, $90,000 down, year six, you refinance, you buy condos two and three. Uh, this is your portfolio value, year 12. You buy uh, property four, five, and six, 
And then year 25, you got a portfolio value of over 8 million and uh, there's a little bit of debt left on that and your equity, you know, you've accumulated 90,000 into, you know, over almost 8 million. So, you know, I don't even know what the return for is that for that is, but it's uh, very high. Let me ask you this question. When, you, when you're refinancing a property, Adam, um, so if you're taking money out of somebody's home and they're taking that money and they're buying, for example, that property that I just bought, I just showed the example of, what's the return on investment? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're not using any of your own money. It's like an infinite return. Yeah, I mean, um, I, don't, I was going to say, I, I, was, I don't even know how to. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's I'm pretty good with math. And I don't even know how to calculate that one on the spot. It's pretty good. Pretty good ROI, I would say. Yeah. So this is my portfolio. This is everything I have. Um, most of these are owned by me personally. I've got a few units with uh, family members here, just a few. And then I've got uh, other properties I haven't even showed here that I own with like a larger group uh, of investors. And um, yeah, so this is it. So you can see actually... I started investing long before 2012, but I don't think I discovered the power of refinancing until after 2012. So unfortunately, I sold a number of properties. Um, I, I thought I had to. This is really important. I thought I had to sell the properties because I couldn't get any more financing. Ryan Coyle could not get any more financing. So what I discovered was I started buying under holding corps. And when I'd go into a bank to get a, a new, new mortgage, they would say, how many pro properties does Ryan Coyle own? And they're very specific, Ryan Coyle. So I would share how many properties I'd sold a few at that point to clear off my books. And they wouldn't see the ones I had under the holding corp. They wouldn't even ask me for it. So my borrowing ability remained very, very strong. And then I've created a strategy where I'm only buying through holding corps now. And, um, you know, I'm thrilled to be working with you, Adam, because I know you're one of few, if any, brokers that have access to holding corps, which we'll get into a little bit later. But, um, you know, that's really... The difference between me owning probably four properties and owning, you know, however many I have here, it, it, it's really because I've been able to structure things in a way that have allowed my borrowing ability to increase drastically. And this is what we do for our clients. This is the stuff I love. This is the stuff my team loves doing for our clients. Um, it's not complicated, um, but, you know, it's it could be a little bit uh, scary because banks ask for a lot of documents and you get rejected a whole bunch. But, um, you know, work with the right team. We'll figure it out for you. So just to highlight what this means and everything I just talked about, the compounding, the leverage, the refinancing, this is what my portfolio looks like with a 3% annualized compounded annual growth rate, which is well below the 45-year average, uh, way, way below the 10, 15-year averages. Um, and this is what, what it looks like in, in 20 years from today. So today's value is around 24 million. In 20 years, it's, it's 42 million at a very conservative approach. Now, if you look at it in 25 years, it's 50 million. 30 years, it's 57 million. Now, this what is like I had to send, I redid this. So, so those of you who have been on many of my presentations, I had to update my portfolio, today's values. I had to send the spreadsheet over to someone much smarter than me to just confirm that this is accurate because I couldn't even believe it. And uh, so this is what it looks like if I take the 45-year Toronto average, which I usually use a 5% for all of my pro formas for clients. I've been using a 6% now, and, and that's very conservative because the 15-year average, I think right now is around almost 9% in Toronto. So the 45-year average with you know a market correction, multiple recessions, interest rates of 20%, uh, has averaged out at 6.6%. And in 20 years, this portfolio will look like 84 million, 25 years, 116 million, and in 30 years, 160 million. This is crazy. I like, I, I just, it's <laughs> unbelievable, but it's just, it's, it's real. Like this is real. This yeah. is, it, it's, it's amazing. And this is what I love doing with my clients. So, um, you know, Adam, I know, I know this is like where we're working on right now. Like I'm pulling out a lot of equity in this and just to be completely like transparent, this is the portfolio value. I have a tremendous amount of debt. <laughs> I don't know what actually what my debt to equity rate ratio is, but you know, let's say even if I had $20 million in debt, the point here is if my, if the real estate market goes up 10% this year, which is a very modest, uh, you know, I think, um, um, you know, kind of forecast based on what you said and what I've, I'm about to go through, my net worth will essentially increase $2.3 million. 
And that's why I have always personally focused on capital appreciation over, over cash flow. And uh, it's really about doubling down and creating that massive wealth. Um, you know, it'll eventually shift to cash flow and then I won't be buying more and I'll just retire and, you know, that'll all be great. But uh, this is just shows everything that I just explained in, in action. This is a really great, that's a really great slide, Ryan, because I, I look at that slide and I get a bit of a chuckle because working with even non-investor clients, but like hundreds and hundreds of clients, it's, it's a common um, topic of discussion. It's, it's unbelievable how many people don't believe in capital appreciation. Like they, they can't, they can't see it. They, they kind of literally go like, well, come on. Like I, you know, and all you have to really do is look at your own situation to understand what capital appreciation meaning if you own your own home yeah what did you buy it for how long have you owned it and what do you think it's worth right now and when you take a moment to really look at that and go holy geez i, I bought my house for one hundred and eighty-five thousand, and i never would have guessed it but 10 years later it's worth six hundred and fifty thousand. well now i mean how can you not believe then that you know, it just it just keeps going, and you can you can literally look at a seventy five year history in Canada, and this has always been the trend. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're going to look at uh, some supply and demand constraints that that are coming in the near future with immigration and just the lack of supply. So, you know, I think um, you know the next ten years is probably going to be even even more uh, you know fruitful than the, the past ten. So this is an example I, I could provide, I mean, thousands of examples, but, uh, you know, I've been showing charts for so long and a lot of people are often like, well, show me some examples. So this is one that just recently sold uh, on MLS. And, and what I really want to highlight here is the compounded growth rate. So I just showed you my portfolio with uh, conservative 3%, you know, I think maybe a conservative 6.6, .6, but hopefully realistic, be very happy with that. And this is 8.4%. So this is over, um, when was this, this person in 2014? And, and, and this is in West Toronto, where the market hasn't appreciated the same as it has in, in downtown East, downtown West, and the downtown core. Um, so an 8.4% annual compounded growth rate is, is, is amazing. And, you know, I can pull thousands of units that uh, have higher rates. And, and that's, I'm working on for the next presentation, I will know what the five-year average is, the 10-year, the 15, 20, 25, um, instead of looking at a, a longer 45-year average. And then just to kind of recap everything here um, and why I think everyone should be investing in pre-construction condos, um, obviously, is, is, you know, there's, there's, that's the formula I shared with you. It's, it's not complicated. We've tried to make it simple. Um, you know, really pre-construction comes down to being the ultimate leverage. It allows you to invest without a mortgage. Um, you know, there's no way I should be able to have as many properties as I, as I have. I've been able to do that, uh, been able to do that by putting deposits down and having condos using equity to stagger them and buy more condos by the time they close. Um, by the take, you know, by the time you take out the mortgage, um, the rent and price appreciation is up in order to do that. Now, this is a pretty staggering number. GTA pre-condo five-year average is 13% versus detached homes. So that's the, always been the story in Toronto, detached homes, detached homes. And the growth rate is 11% and existing condos has been 7.11%. So there you go, that's GTA, not Toronto. Um, now, what, what that means is the condo market is made up of old inventory and is made up of new inventory. The new inventory appreciates at a higher rate than the old inventory. And that's because you're getting better finishes, better amenities, um, all of that stuff. So, um, you know, not only is that piece of paper working really hard for you while you sleep, it's actually outperforming the rest of the market, which is, I think, a staggering uh, statistic. Oh, let me go back there. Downtown pre-con. So here's the downtown pre-con average. So it's 15% versus 11.4 for detached and 6.51 for existing. 45-year average TREB uh, is 6.6%. Uh, and then the other point, again, is, as I mentioned, helps you create passive income and uh, it's an easy hands off way to build serious wealth. For me, it started as a way to supplement my my retirement and my pension plan. And now it's really about my family. I'm going to be able to pass things on. And interesting enough, that's probably the number one reason why most of our clients are, are buying condos now. Pre-construction is because they're they're buying them for their children. They see what's happening here. Uh, they look at other major cities and they want to be make sure that their children will be able to own real estate. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it uh, in terms of my portfolio. 
see a lot of questions, but we'll get to all those shortly. So I'm going to jump in. Adam, feel free to, to, to you know, jump in any time regarding the uh, market update. I'm going to try to fly through it just because I know that took quite, quite a bit more time than I was planning. Um, but feel free to jump in if you want to add anything. Yeah, I will. You're doing a great job. I don't, you know, you kind of know what you're talking about, Mr. Carl. I've done it, done it a few times. So, yeah. yeah. And, and this is like I said at the beginning. Like I love this part. Like I don't get enough time to to look at all of the data. And for me, that portfolio I just showed you are because of market indicators I've looked at over, you know, historical trends and historical market indicators I've looked at. And I'll point those out when we get there. But, you know, this isn't rocket science. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not psychic. Uh, I'm really looking at data to help me make decisions. And, and this is it. So um, hopefully you guys find it compelling. So. Quick update. This is from October. Resale condominium activity reached October record of 2889 sales. So it's the month of October, increased 29% year over year, surpassing the 10 year average. So sales are, are, are crazy right now. Now, what's really interesting is um, okay, this is prices. So when we look at prices, um, you know, prices have obviously they they dipped. And it's quite interesting that. Toronto's condo market has consistently been an upward trend, but it does have those dips and they're, they're, you know, this is obviously a recession slash pandemic, but it's, it's as if the government comes in and does these things and it lets steam out of the market and you see these little dips, but they never last that long, but I think they're healthy little dips. And then it allows, I think that's what's really helped Toronto sustain such a, 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 a you know, sustainable uh, rate of growth. And I think that's why, that's why I look at Toronto as a blue chip because, you know, it's always going to have that sustainable growth. It's it's not susceptible to market corrections like other smaller markets uh, that also have probably unlimited amount of, um, you know, supply. So, you know, it's good to see the Toronto market start coming back. Uh, everyone left Toronto, everyone panicked. And now prices in the 905 have gone up. Low rise prices uh, are very high. And now people are looking at condos again. So it's a really exciting time. Um, and that shows here, this slide here, that the GTA region is still outperforming City of Toronto. It saw 17% year-over-year growth. This was as of October. It's changed a lot since uh, now December. And the City of Toronto was at a 10% year-over-year growth. So anything lost pre-pandemic has been regained. The resale condominium active listing. So this is really interesting. Active listings, resale, uh, re resale listings fell 55% year over year to 3,400 units from a record high 7,651 units last year. Inventory declined to 1.2 months of supply from 3.4 months of supply a year ago. So what that means is anything below three months of supply is considered a seller's market anything above is about well not anything above but you know above that is a balance i think everything above four months i would think is considered a buyer's market this uh market right now is at an all-time low in supply this is 1.2 months in the gta but when you look at downtown toronto we're below one month of supply currently so that means after one month all of the condo inventory listings would be absorbed. So we're operating with incredibly tight uh, supply and demand fundamentals right now. Um, supply is, is, I don't see how they're going to be able to fix this other than, uh, you know, some sort of new government intervention, which will let steam out of the market again. And we'll have maybe a little bit of flat, maybe not as much growth, maybe a little down. But this is a long term trend for Toronto that is just going to be the story for the unforeseeable future. Lease transactions. So it's nice to see Toronto come back to life again. We've got the Raptors, we've got the Maple Leafs, people are starting to come downtown and work again. Um, you know, I was driving downtown uh, in the downtown core yesterday morning. It's still really dead, um, which is unfortunate, but there's been a lot of talks of a lot of companies coming back in, in the new year or several days a week. So I think that's going to change, but it's really great to see the rental market pick up in downtown Toronto, uh, even though the doors to Toronto haven't fully, fully um, opened yet. And right now we're seeing record, uh, record lease transactions, total 2,800 in, in October. Actually, sorry, that declined. October is a really funny month. So what happened was 
Toronto's rental market has suffered uh, a lot, downtown Toronto, from, from COVID because everyone left and no, not a lot of new people were coming in. But as things started to normalize, people started moving back in and we saw a ton of growth. I think we saw about uh, 9%, 10% growth just in July and August of this year. So rents were on the up. And then something happened in August and a lot of things happening in, in COVID are actually, I just can't explain it. It's like some of them are just, you know, there's no real indicators explaining what's happening. But October is a very quiet month in Toronto. And we're like, let's watch and see what happens in November. And then all of a sudden, November is through the roof. So the, the November, December stats, I just rented three of my own condos. I set the price really high, got them rented in a matter of days. So, um, you know, it's going to be really exciting when things actually open up. So average transacted rents were 23.30 in October, edging up only 0.2% month over month, but recording a 9% year over year increase. So we're starting to see that upward pressure. Uh, I think it's going to be probably double digit growth in, in 2022. Uh, rents in October specifically up 16% from January's low of 2011, and we're within 4% of the October 2019 high. So we're almost back to the pre-COVID levels, which is amazing. Um, I don't know who, who the people are, the students that are filling it, because, you know, I know a lot of people are waiting. I know immigration has ramped up, but uh, really the, the floodgates are going to open in the new year with immigration and with the, the offices really opening up. So this is, uh, this is exciting for me because I talked about this in, I think it was January of this year. And I talked about the resurgence of downtown Toronto and it was, you know, all of these market indicators, all these patterns, all this historical data that I looked at to really predict that I thought we were going to see double digit growth this year. And I said du double digit growth. And then I also said uh, probably 20 plus percent growth, which is a staggering number. But I said that solely based on pre numbers uh, of 2017, a record year, which I'll get into, and that the gates to Toronto would open and they didn't. So I undershot a bit, but it did get double digit growth. And what's exciting is downtown Toronto starting to move again. Everyone was going to the 905. Everyone was going everywhere but Toronto. So Toronto seeing a ton of activity. Um, these are the five sub markets, uh, top sub markets, uh, downtown core, it's back. Uh, you know, and supply levels are at an all time low and people are buying here again. So I think that the, the future is bright for, for Toronto real estate. Um, you know, people leave Toronto to find cheaper real estate. And when Toronto becomes cheap, everyone wants to come back. Um, this is just a quick slide to show the upward pressure on sales volume. Um, so we took a big spike there, obviously, during COVID and things are trending upward. This is uh, GTA resale condominium apartment days on average. So nothing, um, you know, to be, you know, uh, I guess afraid of the average is it's right. It's below the, the average uh, condos are selling condos are selling in multiple offers. And this is really cool because a lot of that data was from October. So we put this chart together with some TREB data and this shows where things really started taking off. So it was pretty flat. So this is 2020's numbers, took the dip at the beginning of COVID. It was very flat. And then in August this year, uh, we saw things really start to change. I think it was the nice weather. I think it was like Leafs and Raptors. They're all starting up. There's restaurants. People started moving back to Toronto. People started buying. But also low rise became so exorbitantly high that condos became very attractive again. And, um, you know, I have the data for three bedrooms, but you see a huge spike in three bed condos selling, which is exciting. Um, so this shows just in August, we had uh, an average price of 673, September 686, and October 739. And we're now at an average uh, price in downtown Toronto, 745,000 for a condo price. That's the average, which is uh, a staggering growth. And almost, maybe by the end of the year, we'll hit my 20% as I predicted. So this is an example, because I always like to show you guys examples. This is why I show my, my portfolio. Um, this is a property in, in uh, Bloor West. It sold in July for $989 a square foot. It's on the fourth floor and had the same view as this unit on the fourth floor, floor that sold five months later, uh, just on in December for 1333 per square foot like that's an incredible jump and this is really because of two things supply and demand obviously but also because of the affordability gap people aren't buying houses anymore they're just they're, they're becoming unattainable 
So let's talk about the more macro thing for the Toronto market. We've got, and we're for Canada, I guess, the entire market. We've got huge Im immigration growth. We've got an, an anticipated 411,000 permanent residents coming in 2022. That number is increasing every year. And what's interesting is newcomers represent one in five home buyers. 75% of them come with savings to buy a home. I don't think a lot of people understand that or appreciate that. And immigrants are really the economic growth. Canada attracts highly skilled economic class immigrants who tend to occupy high paying jobs, uh, professional and managerial roles. 95% uh, of them are working within the year following their admission and their earnings exceed Canadian averages soon after landing and increase over time. Now, this is a really interesting slide. So as established immigrants are more likely to own their home than Canadian born individuals, recent immigrants have also shown increased propensity to buy. So what, that sh what this shows here is that newer uh, immigrants and, 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 and older immigrants that have been here for a period of time are actually the ones buying most of the properties in the higher price range. And do you see that Adam? Absolutely. So th this was, this, this wasn't like totally shocking to me, but to see that we've across, seen, like, um, we see it. Um, it's been a little, it, obviously, again, you've been mentioning, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it pandemic times, obviously it was, it was, uh, um, a little different, but all the forecasts are are for uh, a lot of activity moving forward as things get opened up again. Yeah, so people are talking about well, how how high can prices really go? But when you have a huge amount of inflow of of people, you know, emigrating to Canada, a lot of them are coming from countries that have really expensive real estate and Canada doesn't necessarily look that expensive. And if they're the ones buying for the most part in the higher price points, that could be a lot to do with driving the market higher. So this puts Canada on a, or Toronto, I should say, on a, on a, on a world scale where a lot of people are uh, migrating from. So, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't actually look that expensive. Now, another interesting thing I'll just point out here is our yield, gross rental yield for Toronto, is higher than all of the countries um, that are, are more expensive than us. So what that means is we actually have higher rental yields. So the rents are very high here. So we've got a very, you know, balanced, healthy market from that perspective. Now we've got all this growth, but what's happening with supply? So this is kind of the terrifying thing and, and where I don't really know how high prices can go and what the government's going to do to fix it. But Really, we got about 120,000 people coming to the GTA every year. That equates to, I think we need about 2.3 people per household formation. So we need about 52, 53,000 new homes every year. Our construction industry built less than 30,000 homes last year, which was a record year. So, you know, first of all, we don't have the places to build in the GTA, especially Toronto, uh, let alone the capacity to build it. Um, and this is where the, the, the people are migrating to people want to be in the density. The jobs are in Ontario and people are tend to come to, um, you know, downtown Toronto. So this is, uh, this is my market indicator. This is what I've always looked at to kind of get a really good idea of where the condo market is going to go in, in the next 12 months. And this is really interesting. So the average price for a detached home in 416 is currently 1.8 million and 745,000 for a condo. It's a difference of over a million dollars. So detached homes, even semis, they're, they're considerably higher than condos at this point. And what that does, it becomes an affordability issue. So people are going to only be able to afford so much house. Everyone wants a house with a pool. Everyone wants a house with a backyard, but they can't afford it. So what becomes the next best option? Um, it becomes condos. And, and that's really why buildings are becoming more expensive because they're building amenities to cater to families. We're building larger units and we're doing a really good job at catering to that influx of young families that you didn't necessarily see in condos in Toronto when I started doing this 15 years ago. So it's really exciting. Another thing I want to point out here, just to talk about the supply and demand um, constraints we have right now. Detached homes in November had a 1.2%, a negative 1.2% change in, in sales volume, where condos saw a 44% uptick. So this is a crazy demand shift. And I always go back to 2017 because we saw this happen. I talked about this in a past presentation. I predicted what was going to happen. Not exactly. And I'm not a genius. I'm just looking at this data. 
But this shows a very similar market where detached homes are down, sales volume down five and a half percent. So the de demand was down and condos demand was up 26 percent. And what happened that year, the gap wasn't even close to that big. But uh, condos appreciated 26 percent that year and detached homes actually depreciated 2.8 percent. So we're seeing a lot of that. And then the other affordability gap I'm talking, I like to look at and talk about is the 905 416 gap. So what that means is a lot of people leave Toronto when they can't afford Toronto and they go to the 905 and then prices in 905 start outpacing downtown Toronto. And then that gap actually starts to narrow. And once that becomes a narrow gap, people start looking back at Toronto again. So the pandemic has really sped that kind of cyclical gap up because a lot of people just scrambled. They just like ran out of Toronto and they went to 905, Mississauga everywhere. So the growth is still higher in the 905, but that gap is getting narrow, which means you're going to see a demand shift for people wanting to live downtown, go to restaurants, go to bars and do all that stuff. So, um, Key takeaways, Toronto market remains resilient and, you know, it continues to, which is, which is amazing. And, you know, extremely low supply level with high demand, I think is really painting a picture for what to expect in, in, in 2022. Um, you know, I'll go and say another prediction here this year. I, I think we're probably going to see another year of probably about 12 to 16% growth um, within the next 12 months. And, and just to add to that, I know the government will intervene and hopefully it lets a little bit of steam up. I'm happy to steam out of the market. I don't like years of 16% back to back. I don't like 20% growth. Uh, I like sustainable growth. So, you know, if something happens or is a correction, people don't get, you know, caught, um, you know, left out to cold. So uh, immigrants, uh, will, immigration, sorry, will be off the charts next year. It's going to open up. Things have opened up slowly. We're already seeing what's happening with that. And construction just simply can't keep up. I don't know how that problem is going to be solved. Uh, I don't think anyone does. So we've got ex extremely tight supply constraints. And history doesn't lie. I use market indicators, the affordability gaps, I think paints a really, really compelling picture about what to come, what's to come in, in, in the new year. And hopefully the doors to Toronto fully open. I know there's, you know, a lot happening in the world and with uh, COVID and the new uh, variant, but I think, you know, we've done a really good job and, and I think things will normalize hopefully in, in later in 2022 and we'll think we'll be back to normal. So Adam, that went a lot longer than I expected. There's a, a lot of data, which is really exciting stuff. Uh, I tried to fly through it, but I'm excited to hear you speak now. So what I want to really go through is 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 from a mortgage financing perspective, you know, how to leverage equity in your house. Um, this whole leverage topic we've been talking about. So, you know, um, I always say there's two two big things you can do if you leverage the equity in your home. Um, <clears throat> one is pay off high interest debt, and and that's always a good thing. Um, uh, which I'll get into in a minute, and the other is to invest. Maybe you're pulling out equity to invest in your current piece of real estate, and most certainly you're, pull, you're pulling out equity you're leveraging to invest in, in condos, as we've been talking about today. So I find a lot of people, I mean, for some of you, this might not be rocket science. For some of you, it's just a good refresher. Some of you just might be very unclear of, of how much equity can you leverage. And so you can sort of just take a piece of paper and a pencil on your side and and using some rough numbers that, that, that you have handy, uh, figure out how much equity you have access to, you know, instantly today. You don't, you, you might need some recommendations on how best to do it, but you know the number. So let's say your the value of your home was 800,000. The, the rules on uh, leverage and, and refinance or equity takeouts is we, we can only finance up to 80% of the appraised value of your, of the subject property of, your primary residence or investment property that we're um, leveraging. So in this example of 800,000, that means that the most, uh, our refinance limit is 640,000. 20% equity always remains in the home. So let's say you're, that's where people get a little bit confused um, on the math is let's say your current mortgage that you had with your bank was 300,000. Your new limit can be 640,000 max it means that we could put a home equity line of credit or refinance your mortgage for an additional $340,000 on your primary residence 
with which with connect i mean you could put to very good use building your portfolio and that's what ryan's been doing um, so well over time um, it's important to note that there's this other silly government rule i call it but um, the maximum amount of revolving credit we call it which is a home equity line of credit that you can put on on a property right now is 65 percent. so revolving credit is credit that you can use, pay off, and use again. A very powerful tool, especially if you're, if you're doing that on investment properties where your tenants are paying, paying it off. Um, but normally what we're able to do is, is structure it all the way to 80% with a little bit of a mortgage portion and the rest, the 65% as the revolving home equity line of credit portion. But let's say in that same example, if you had no mortgage on your home, and all you wanted was a home equity line of credit on the home to invest, the maximum home equity line of credit you could get would, would be 520,000, 65% of 800, not 80%. So now what do you do with, with, you know, with this brand new shiny home equity line of credit that you, you just arranged? Most certainly, I mean, it just falls into, you know, good, good finances, taking care of business. You may have some other much higher uh, interest credit card debt or unsecured line of credit debt. 19% on some of these things is quite low. I mean, there's, there's cards out there that I see every day that are 28%. To be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of using a home equity line of credit to consolidate debt. My recommendation might be to build that into like a bit of a mortgage portion and also clears the way some of you have questions I see about debt servicing and things tidy while we're getting you uh, prepared to purchase investment properties we're also tidying up your situation so that you um, look better on the application for all these uh, additional properties um, obviously what, one of the uses is to, to use it to buy investment properties and as we mentioned the interest on that then becomes tax deductible you could invest in no one's stopping you in, uh, you know, stocks or bitcoins or all these things. Right? You know, we we were sort of uh, hinting at, uh, but I'm going to show you on the next slide that it, you know, it's not something I, I would recommend, anyways. Um, and uh, you know, or you could go on vacation. You could take twenty thousand dollars and and go off on a nice uh, Hawaii vacation on your brand new home equity line of credit. No, don't do that. That's not that's not the plan. Uh, Good debt versus bad debt, good leverage versus bad leverage. Don't use your home equity line of credit to uh, go to Hawaii and leave that balance riding. So well, eventually, eventually, no? Eventually. Well, listen, you got to have a little bit of fun, but um, you're never going to hear me recommend it. You know what? It was crazy. The first time I refinanced, um, I, I just couldn't even believe it. I, I, I pulled out money and I went and bought a car and I was just like, what just happened? Like I just... <laughs> but then, before I really started doubling down on my portfolio, I, I bought an Audi A5 and I was just like, forget well, listen, I mean, I'm a real life. I mean, listen, I get it. I like things and stuff and I've, I've built up some equity. I want to use it. But to me, there's there's um, there's better ways to do it, which I'm going to touch on on the, on on the last slide. If you have some personal needs and want to get set up for success on an investment portfolio. I mean, I if I didn't buy that car, I would have had another condo and I'd be a little bit further ahead, but uh, I did enjoy it. It was fun. It's not tax deductible if you go to Hawaii or buy a car. And so, it, it, listen, we should just, you know, go through it. Right. I, you know, Ryan gave some amazing stats. I had not seen um, uh, some of those slides. Uh, very current. Thank you, Ryan. I had inserted this slide, the real magic, because I sort of wanted to compare, uh, you know, an you know, a secure real estate investment versus uh, speculating in the market, having some mutual fund manager uh, that you don't even know their name, uh, investing your stuff or, or, or whatever. I mean, <clears throat> you look at a very, very, very conservative uh, example here. Very, and it, it's very conservative. Ryan and I were talking about this earlier. Um, and in a 10 year span, um, you go from $109,000 in equity in your property to $475,000 in equity in your property. Uh, I mean, that's an increase in equity of 366,000 in a very real conservative. I'm a conservative. I like, you know, I like to take chances, but I like looking at things conservatively. It's a $366,000 increase in equity in 10 years. 
um, which is $36,000 per year or $3,000 a month. Um, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Listen, I wanted to just sort of uh, leave everyone with some, um, some real value here today. Um, you know, where do you start? Or, you know, maybe you, you've learned something today or you need a review. I, the first thing you have to do is get pre-positioned. Um, some people call it pre-approved. I, I, I learned and call it pre-positioned ahead of time. You have to have a mortgage professional uh, analyze your situation and um, tell you what you can accomplish based on what you own today um, it, or, or help you get that first one and then help you plan out ahead of time where we really think this can go. To be honest with you, um, whether you're going to invest or not, I personally feel there's never been a better time to, for everyone to have a review of their situation. Um, interest rates are still close to all-time lows. Um, equity, uh, uh, you know, as we all know, is at an all-time high, making more possible. There is a bit of trepidation. Um, I'm not fear-mongering here, but there's a lot of people that maybe don't want to come up for renewal in 2023 or 2024 if they can help it. Um, no one has a crystal ball, but there's a feeling out there that rates may go up a tad. Um, and so if you do something soon, you'd have, you know, a brand new five year situation till 2026, 2027. So there's a lot of really, really good, good reasons to just have a review in general and get set up. But the, the key is to get, get set up in advance. And that's what I'm doing right now with you. Um, question for you. I'm just curious. Most people coming in to do a refinance of their primary residence or I guess investment properties, are they finding um, like they're getting a better rate? Because I, I know a client of mine did a refinance a few months ago and they were just thrilled because their monthly payments uh, actually became lower than the current ones, but they took out a bunch of money and bought a condo with it. Well, that's, that, that, that's yeah, that's, that's a perfect segue. That's what's amazing right now is that you know, one of the first things we look at when we're looking at a, a restructuring of your primary residence is sort of the Cadillac of all products is the re-advance of a mortgage, we call it, which is, right. you know, a mortgage that it's maybe a bit of mortgage. Um, it's definitely a brand new home equity line of credit limit. But then over time, as you pay down the principal of your mortgage, more equity opens up automatically. So you don't need to do this again. Well, as we're looking at that, you know, sometimes if that's the best thing you know you're going to be in penalties on on your new mortgage maybe you've got some other debt as well though um with rates where they are today we can often do this restructuring justify the penalty um lower your overall payments and let you tap into this equity to, to start investing so i i really really say it with conviction they're literally in the past year and, and currently has never really been a better time to ever have your mortgage uh analyzed I, again investor tips be open to all the options alternative lending solutions is is just one example you know you have to look at things differently as an investor being there done that there's private money there's i mean um there's uh, non-major banks that do a lot of wonderful things for example we have lenders that when you're at the finish line and closing on your your condo four years from now we have lenders that would lend on um a hundred percent of the uh, purchase price based on the new higher appraised value. And what that means is not only do you get a mortgage on the property, but you get all your original deposit money back and you do it again. This is called leverage. But if you're out sort of saying, give me, you know, prime minus 1.3, like RBC gave me on my primary residence, you know, you're not that that's not, that, that's, that might be possible, but good investors are open to, they're seeing the bigger picture that Ryan just sort of laid out for you earlier in the presentation. Well, I, I took a mortgage. Um, I just noticed my sister's on this with my sister, a property we bought together. It's at 10%. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, we got to fix it that. It seems but... crazy. Um, <laughs> it, it's going to make a lot of sense once this is said and done. It's, it's a reno, it's a flip. And I should have pointed out, I, I'm a huge advocate of pre-construction because I think it just allows you to do more. But I do own a few multi-residentials. You're, you're going to be refinancing. We're already talking about those uh, multi-unit ones I'm doing. Yeah, and I didn't want to, you know, take up a lot of time, like, with the whole, my whole opinion on alternative lending solutions. But I did want to just say be open. Right now, because overall rates are so low, 
rates with alternative lending solutions are also very, very low. Like rates that we used to kill for at a major bank, they have currently, and so why not? I'm yeah, obviously... What, sorry, what, did you find, what did you find? Like you just did an incredible deal for a good client of mine at uh, seven units under a holding corp in the same building. Like what, what type of rate? That was, a, I think, a private or a B anyway. Yeah, and um, we... Uh, we, like we did all seven of them, seven of them, I think in and around 3.5%, don't quote me. And, uh, but it was in a whole co and it was seven units all together. I mean, um, every situation is different. Seven units in one building. Many banks, I think, are just blocking, didn't even want to do it. It's a commercial transaction. Um, and I chuckle because we're so spoiled right now on interest rates. People used to, like when I say used to, you know, three years ago, we would have killed for three and a half percent. And now it's like, oh my God, you give me three and a half. Meanwhile, the tenants are paying it. And you're getting the mortgage that you want to get on to the next one and leverage and, and away you go. So, yes. I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, I'm a little biased, obviously, just in general, I work with the mortgage broker, not just me, but work with the mortgage broker. But as an investor, I think I'm especially biased. Um, bank relationships are good, but I cannot tell you how many times I've had, like over the years, I've had people come up to me and say, yeah, I'd love to buy an investment property, but don't think I can. The bank told me I'm not qualified. Yeah. And what you have to understand is every bank has their own rules, their own appetites. Um, there's the, you know, the major banks are just one option and credit unions. Uh, there's all the alternative lending solutions and diversification is key. And you need to work with a good mortgage broker that's going to help you plan out your portfolio. Maybe dabble in a few bank direct bank deals. Listen, I'm not opposed to it, but a modern day mortgage broker um, can that knows what they're doing can help you coordinate this. So I'm, I'm a little biased. And then, um, you know, my other tip is just do it. I mean, it's funny that I hadn't even really seen the bottom of that slide, Ryan. You said this about 10 slides ago, but at the end of the day, some people just, you know, they get organized yeah. and then do it. Action. And then other analysis paralysis. Analysis, analysis paralysis. And I guess from a financing perspective, we can normally look you dead in the eye. If, you, if we've got you pre-positioned, we're good and organized, we've reviewed some documents, we can say, just go for it. Because you know what? In four years, there's no way we are going to let you down. We can close on that condo any number of ways so that that transaction happens to your liking in the future. So just, just take a chance. Just we sold it. thousands, thousands of units have never had anyone default and not be able to close. Yeah, it's, it's because it's because of the values and everything. It's just impossible not to close. Uh, we're going to jump into Q&A. I just had kind of like a summary of summing up the presentation. I just I think this is so important and, and you actually just touched on it. But, you know, I, I think it's so important to just work with the right team. There's a lot of noise out there. Um, you know, Adam's an investor. I'm an investor. If you want to invest, I suggest you work with an investor. Um, you know, the, the agents on my team are homeowners. They're investors. Uh, we all yeah, do it. Can, can I just touch on that first one, Ryan? Sorry to interrupt. But work with the right team of experts. Honestly, guys, be a willing participant. Be a willing participant. And the experts will help you get to the next level. And what do I mean by that? I work with some real estate investors. I say, can you send me the backup for the couple of properties you own? And this is it. And I, I swear a binder arrives in the mail with everything beautifully in it, or they get their assistant to, or, or, or they have it all and they email me everything, or I'll go get it or whatever, and they can't wait. And others are more resistant, like, why do you need that? Can't you just tell me what I can do? And, and um, so be a willing participant and the right team of experts will get you to the next level. Yeah, I think it's just building a team, right? Like you're, you're, you're both members on the team, work together, everything will work, uh, you know, work together really well. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, yeah. if your goal is to, to buy 10 condos, you work with someone who's bought 10 condos. Uh, that's the way I did it. That's what I recommend. Um, create a goal, uh, take action and just keep it simple. This, uh, you know, this might have been complicated for some people. Uh, it doesn't have to be. It might sound that way. I think the the most discouraging and challenging thing with being an investor is just, you know, banks saying no and having to go ask someone else for financing and just kind of the what you just said, having the binders being organized like that is just kind of frustrating. It's not it's not hard. It's just it can be a little bit of work, but uh, this will help you over time, by the way. A lot of it is we have all of our clients deal, but then we help you plan it out. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I give I've given you everything now, which was a ton of work over the last yeah. uh, a week or so. But now you uh, have. Lo and behold, you were a willing participant, Ryan. So I, I yeah. was. Well, I'm eager to, to refinance. But um, yeah, I mean, with our clients, most of our deals are saved. Or they are now. And, and we lease most of our clients' units. So we have everything. So we're, you know, we'll work really well and be able to provide some of their information to you as well. Um, I have a ton of questions. I don't know if there's any particular ones that jumped out uh, to you that you want to answer. Maybe I'll just start with this one. And then if you see one. Uh, Adam, um, this question is from Julie. She's asking, how would a first time pre-construction condo buyer use the equity in their home to make the staggered deposits without using out of pocket funds? Yeah, great question. So you, um, you, you get pre-positioned, as I say, which is we take a look at your current situation and how much equity can we, can we tap into? And then we, we complete a new transaction. That's what it comes down to. We restructure what you already have going if it's not set up that way on your current property. Um, often investors like to do what I call compartmentalization. So they, they like to know they're still on track to pay down their, their main mortgage that, that, that they're working on or that they have. And we get them uh, like a, a home equity line of credit or a um, actually you can, you can do it in multiple chunks. Um, and, and you do that you know, first get it. And it doesn't take long. You get it all organized so that now you have this home equity line of credit and you can do just what Ryan and I have been talking about where you can now write a check off your home equity line of credit for these deposits, which eventually become your technically your, your down payment on, on the new condo. It's interesting. I actually don't do that. I, I refine. It's funny. I had this question uh, the other day and, and I'm glad Julie, I don't know everything. So uh, I did suspect that that was the case, but I've always just refinanced. I take out the money and, uh, but that is really interesting. So for the line of credit, I assume that was accurate that you can just draw from it when you need it. So you're not paying interest on the money until you actually draw it. Correct. If you set it, if you do it, your deposits as a home equity line of credit, then in the end, home equity lines of credit are fully open. Right. So you're only paying interest when you draw it over the staggered time that the developer has. And, uh, and then in the end, if, if you know, you want to restructure it into a mortgage, but sometimes for these uh, tax deductions, it's pretty handy to have that separate statement showing the interest that's being paid on that, that you can give to your accountant. But yeah. there, there has been an argument, Ryan, just to um, sort of back you up there. Uh, it's a tough debate because mortgage rates are considerably lower than even a home equity line of credit. Home equity line of credit's got an incredible rate, you know, prime, say prime plus a half, sometimes yeah. two, one, some two nine, but, but a variable rate mortgage right now, you can get at like 1.4 yeah. on the refi. That's how I've always done interest that. savings there. And then I put it in a savings interest bearing account, I write off the interest. Um, yeah, there will be a recording. Uh, sorry, guys, it's been a long, long one. We'll, we'll, we'll stick around for maybe 10, 15 minutes more uh, Q&A, uh, but we are recording it and we will send it out. Um, Cola asked, the condo management fees sometimes make the rental inadequate to cover the mortgage. Uh, this oh, the message, the, this question just went away, but essentially is asking, um, I think he's just making a point that sometimes, uh, you know, the, the rent doesn't cover the mortgage. Um, that is true. That is why I like pre-construction. If you're to buy a resale property today, you'd probably need about 30% down, uh, maybe more 35% to be cash flow neutral or positive. If you buy pre-construction right now, um, you know, some projects still look 20% down by the time they're ready. I just bought two in gallery of three downtown Toronto. Uh, I predict my, my, both my units will be very cash flow positive by the time they're done in five years. Um, so there's still our opportunities. Um, I also, you need to, to also think about this cash flow is money in your pocket every month, but you're also paying down equity. So your tenants also paying, I don't, you know, the math, Adam, like if you have a $500,000 mortgage, uh, you know, roughly how much equity are you paying down every month? Um, well, I will bring out my trusty calculator. So what, I, what I'm saying there is that, you know, sure, cash flow might be negative, but if you're, you know, investing $200 a month in a mutual fund, I think it's going to go a lot further by just being cash flow negative to $200 a month and then be getting all of that capital appreciation, uh, which is a huge, much bigger return than the appreciation because you're hugely leveraged, uh, highly leveraged. Um, so two and a half 
percent, it's 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 every pay over half of every payment is principal, and that's on a thirty year Great. amortization. Yeah, so I mean the number is staggering. So yeah, you're out of pocket potentially if you're cash flow negative, but you have to consider the amount that you're putting in your bank every month. You're paying down the mortgage. Um, any questions that you saw that you wanted to answer, Adam? Oh God, I, I wasn't even going through the, the list. Okay. I, so, on, that note, on that one note, though, I mean, I always speak to investors about opportunity costs too. So you're not restructuring your home again to go go to or the investment property to go to Hawaii. You're restructuring the home to put a deposit on another property. Normally, I related to mortgage choices, but just in general, you know, look at if I didn't restructure my mortgage, then I'm doing a little better on on that property, but I'm not buying the other property. But if I'm doing a little worse on the current property, it's given me the ability to buy another property. And Ryan, you already went through that math earlier in the presentation. Yeah. And to yeah. me, that math wins. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of the long-term approach. Eventually, everyone will get there. Um, how do you get around debt service ratios? Yeah. And so um, um, debt service ratios. So first of all, I mean, we have, again, I'm going to beat it to death. We have to do that prepositioning and we take a look at it. Maybe your debt servicing ratios are just fine. And maybe it's just one bank's opinion. And believe me, there there's a lot of different opinions. We can get around them with alternative lending. There's a lot of really great non-major banks but they're they're great lenders full featured mortgages that if you have your your deposits and you have a you know basically a pulse they're going to going to give you the mortgage and that that's one way around it um the the key is to to have an evaluation and then what we're going to always do is put forth the best possible mortgage solution to help you accomplish your goal um that's what it comes down there's many ways to overcome that I mean, look, at the end of the day, there's no right that I should have as many mortgages as I have. There's always a way around it. Uh, you could do it through. Oh, Holdco is another way, by the way. Holdco. Another way. Um, I, I, I cannot walk into a bank right now, Ryan Coyle, the individual, and get a mortgage. Um, well, I mean, that's up for debate. You say I can, but I've been told I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, dis I, dis I disagree with Ryan on that big time. But but, uh, but I just know from dealing with major banks, it's very challenging for, through, through that, that channel anyway. But um you know, I, I can because I'm financing probably four or five units this year. So that's because I've structured it in a way that allows me to get more financing through doing it through Holden Corps. Uh, we help our clients set up Holden Corps. We help them do exactly that. Uh, and we help them navigate when the time comes to be able to do that and execute well. Um, I just sold my duplex. I guess I should hel have held on to it. Yeah, Tom, like, I don't know enough about your property, but you know, often the misconception is you either need to sell a property to buy more because you can't get more financing, or you may not know how much equity you have access to and you could pull out that equity and um, defer the tax on it. And, and often you're left with more money in your pocket by doing a refinance, more in your pocket, not after tax, but because it's a tax deferral in your pocket to reinvest than if you were to sell it and pay a capital gain. So because the capital gain is based on your nominal tax rate, uh, nominal tax rate at time of sale, right. and you worry about it 100 years later, as you said, Ryan, and you're earning a lot less than you are today. Correct. How far apart should you stagger them uh, to be able to close on all of them? Uh, you know, it's, it's a tough question. That's from Benny and Collingwood uh, or Benny Collingwood. Sorry. Um, it's a tough question to answer just because the, the, the closing dates and occupancy dates are, are floating. They're rarely ever hit on schedule. Um, but, you know, if a building, someone comes to me today and says, I want to buy a condo. It's going to be built in two years. I want all this appreciation. I want to do what you do. I would say, look, that's pretty risky. I, I don't suggest it. Let's look at a project that's going to be ready in four or five five, six years, ideally. And then you've got ample, um, you know, appreciation and equity to be able to refinance and, and repeat this. And, you know, if you buy two properties today, you just kind of double down and you're going to have twice as much borrowing power, or refinancing power in, in five years. So that's the kind of way that it works. Um, I know someone asked me about um, trying to find the question, but I know it was regarding developers asking firm approvals. Um, most developers don't. Most developers are asking for mortgage letters, um, which 
you know, satisfies the, the builders, uh, lenders, so they can get construction financing. They're, they're not really worth more than the paper they're written on. They're a pretty easy thing to get. Uh, commitments, uh, firm approvals are becoming, I don't want to say common, but they're, they are a thing. Um, we can help with that. Adam could help with that. There's there's ways to do it. Um, we had I know Daniels and tried all the hardest. Uh, there are mortgage brokers and lenders that make the process easy. So it's not like you're getting a real mortgage, although the process is a little bit more tedious than a mortgage pre-approval letter. Lately, we've been doing sort of the when it gets right down to the nitty gritty, the full fully qualified approval. It's not it's fairly pain, painless. And back to that other question. Don't forget, we just you know funded seven in the same building yes. within one week. So as long as you're good and organized, to me, the, 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 uh, the, bigger, the bigger thing is, um, the bigger factor is, do you have enough seed capital to meet all the deposit requirements, which is what we've been talking about today on all these units? Because as long as we're organized and we get going on things, occupancy, we can, we, we can close many, many mortgages for you all within a very short time span. But did you have the seed capital and were you organized all along the way to meet all those deposit requirements is the key. Yeah, for sure. Important point. Um, let me just find another question here. Where did the screen go? For a new investor, what would you say is the first thing they should do? Um, yeah. I mean, I think we both said the same thing. It's just really take action, come up with a plan. Uh, take action, work with professionals that have done what you want to do. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of noise in, in my industry. There's a lot of agents claiming they, uh, you know, have access to projects that they don't. Most agents don't. Um, you want to work with a qualified platinum agent. You want to ask them questions. You want to ask them how many properties they own. Ask, you know, a little bit more sophisticated questions, where those properties are, how much it's worth, what's their mortgage and see if they are truthfully doing um, what you want to do. Because unfortunately, um, there's 52,000 realtors in Toronto. And, you know, it's a very small percentage of them that actually do what we're talking about here. Um, so I think it's important. And I don't want to like, you know, step on my industry or, 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 or the other the people in it. But it's just the reality of it. Ask questions. I think it's really important. I think the same probably goes to with the mortgage industry. Um, unfortunately, I've heard nightmare stories, people, you know, over promising, under delivering uh, mortgage brokers. Um, I can tell you the reason I told all of my clients I referred to Adam that I have not used him yet. I'm waiting to see how a few deals go. And he did these deals and it was, it was incredible. Uh, the deals you did, which I mentioned earlier, um, I have not been able to have anyone else do. And at good rates. So that's crazy. Yeah. Julie asks, uh, how do you take into consideration your clients KYC? Know your client to make sure three to five years down the line, they are going to be okay with looming rising interest rates. That's actually a really intelligent question julie great job i mean government take to me government takes care of part of that because when you know we do as i just mentioned do a legitimate uh fully qualified pre-approval before you go embark on this adventure sometimes we're looking at again restructuring what you currently have um as part of that process um so i'm very co comfortable issuing the approvals that the developers need to see but then um, i mean the government has the government stress test right now uh, and so, you know, we're qualifying people at an interest rate today of five and a quarter percent and the rate they're going to get is, you know, well, as I just mentioned, I mean, uh, technically you could get 1.45 or something, um, like that on a variable. And so we're qualifying people at a much, much higher interest rate. Uh, these are conventional purchases. They're not 5% down type purchases, meaning there's usually at least 20% equity. And then you have the way Ryan recommends doing it is brilliant because with the capital appreciation you're in a really secure position down the road um and if you're in a jam you could get out and make a profit so um yeah that's my answer on that so i just had a uh, question from jean michel who i know he's a good client of ours um which actually ties into one that someone had previously sent to me so um the other question was, where is the best place and time to invest right now? And, and Jean Michel's was uh, with prices and pre-con at all time highs. Is it still worth investing in pre-cons 
versus resale. So I could kind of answer both those questions in one thing. So I, I do believe Toronto is the place to invest. I have condos in Waterloo. Uh, I've got properties in Hamilton. Um, I've had properties in Kingston. And I, I, you know, the, the majority of my portfolio is, is in Toronto. I'm a firm believer it's a blue chip market. This is where the REITs end up. This is where, uh, you know, big markets bet their, 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 you know, funds and capital on for sustainable kind of predictable growth. Um, you know, and it's, it's really just where are the, the, the new demand, where is the demand going? And the demand is to be in the urban cores. We've got a tremendous amount of demand from new immigrants and from people taking jobs downtown. And we're just not able to create housing for this demand. And, you know, if you're looking, for example, in Alberta, Calgary, for example, they could build homes probably thousands of, mi thousands of miles out. There's never going to be a supply restriction there like you have in, in Toronto. Um, you know, even outside of the, the GTA or the downtown core, there's, there's a lot of places to build. But when you stay within, you know, downtown east, downtown west, there certainly are a lot of, uh, of cranes. But what there isn't a lot of is new land to develop. And land acquisitions uh, prices are at an all time high, uh, but transactions are low and uh, approvals or, or applications for developments in downtown Toronto are, you know, starting to taper off as well because it's just we're running out of land to build. So, you know, this is a long term thing for me. I'm happy with moderate growth, even though it's been very good, uh, much higher than what I ever anticipated. Um, but I think, you know, it's also a hedge that if, if you're in another market that's more susceptible to market downturns, um, you know, I, I just I, I like Toronto. I'm going to always bank on Toronto. It's the supply and demand fundamentals. It's the affordability gap. That's all very predictable to me. Uh, the best time to buy is now. Um, there's some really good opportunities. It's interesting to see pricing right now in, in 905 and surrounding areas. They're getting up to 1300 foot in projects, 1200 foot in projects. And there's still some projects that are 1100 foot in downtown Toronto, less than what is in, in the surrounding areas. To, to me, that those are the best deals all day long. Uh, you can reach out to our team and we're happy to share you share those opportunities with you. Um, where else can I tell you? Um, I recently just bought in Galleria 3. I recently just bought in Bauhaus condos. And uh, that's where I'm buying now. Resale versus, sorry, long answer, long question. Uh, resale versus pre-con. I like pre-construction because I would have never been able to walk into a bank and get 30 mortgages, uh, you know, all at once or even within a close period of time. I was able to use the equity um, that had accumulated from putting down a deposit on a piece of paper to taking out a mortgage four or five years later to allow me to, to have the borrowing ability and just to be uh, more flexible. Also, I would have never been able to manage, you know, 40, 35 existing properties. It's a lot. So the fact that I have them staggered, it, it just works really well for me. Um, it's also very tight right now. You, you like pre-con prices are higher than resale prices, but not by a lot anymore. That's changed in the last two weeks. Um, that example I showed you is in, in downtown what in high park is 1300 a square foot. That's the price of pre-construction right now in the downtown core. So things are changing really quickly. Um, you know, putting a deposit today and getting that appreciation is always what makes the most sense to me. Um, Julie has another, here's, um, so Deke, uh, example, refinance of house one paid for house two with some savings added i plan to refinance house two to pay for house three love it however i'm thinking about mortgage qualification for house three due to debt service so i'll answer the first part if you had house one and two in a holding corp when you go to a bank to get finance for house three they wouldn't even see house one and two and then you can answer the rest because I don't think that's the case, Adam. Well, I mean, um, you know, it, it, it's difficult. I it's difficult for me to answer that question precisely, my friend, just because I would need to review your situation. I'm sure there's loss that's possible, and it just has to be laid out properly and presented properly to that third lender. But by the same token, maybe you want to sort of leverage property number two, as you're mentioning, and do some. Uh, pre-con condos because you don't need the mortgage today 
and we're just going to give you enough, make sure you have enough funds to do your deposits and away you go. So there's lots to talk about there. I'm yeah. Really happy to help. Yeah. yeah. It gets on a case by case. Um, Lee is asking when we looked to refinance, does primary residence, uh, is it better than a rental property? Uh, does that matter? I, I don't actually know the answer to that. No, I mean, um, you'd look at both for sure. You want to be well set up on your primary. And, and if possible, you want to restructure your investment properties as well. Uh, constantly working with many clients that are doing it all at once. And one of the reasons we do it all at once, if you already own a few properties, is I have to, you know, your broker or banker has to bug you less because we collect all your documents and we can do we do everything now with, with these fresh documents, whether, you know, pay stubs or tax returns or all that silly stuff we have to bug you for. Uh, and, and we can sort of, plan it all out with you and do it all at once and then you're off to the races so i love i love those uh because um spreading it out is just more tenuous on on the client all right wow there's a lot of questions here um just trying to find ones that are different i think we'll do one more oh no nortel yeah no that was a bad one um so tax deferral, is that only possible if you're holding these properties in a corporation? No. Is that correct? This is Kieran. No, that, that's not. Tax, tax. Anytime you use money to, borrowed money to, to invest for the purpose of producing an income, that is a tax, a business expense, essentially. I am no accountant. So if I said that with poor terminology, I apologize. But um, okay, let's just do one more. Uh, I've heard recently that some pre-construction developers are canceling agreements. How can we protect against that? The, the, first of all, the thing I love about pre-construction is that like the worst case scenario, you get your money back. Uh, it's unfortunate that some projects have been canceled and you've lost years of appreciation. Uh, that's really unfortunate. But like my Nortel example, for for example, <laughs> is, uh, you know, I, I didn't get my money back. So that is the worst case scenario. Um, your money's held with, uh, you know, a top law lawyer's legal firm's trust account. It's held in trust. Um, but yes, yeah, some some projects developers have canceled. So uh, supply chain issues, cost of building, um, you know, not being a very qualified builder where their performers were bad and they underestimated the undertaking and the costs involved. Um, they've come to buyers recently and said, either you give us more money to make this viable or we have to cancel the project. And, you know, that's not reflective of pre-construction. That's a few poorly organized uh, developers. Um, you know, I don't think it's the most professional thing. I, I probably, you know, the Tridels and the Daniels and the big developers of the world, they don't do that. You don't hear that happen. Adam, we're going to sign off. That was my longest uh, webinar to date. Sorry for taking an hour and a half. Out of your day. I, uh, I appreciate it. And I'm going to hop off this and finish getting you my documents to get that portfolio of mine refinanced. See you, everybody. I probably, I probably will, yeah, I probably will go on a vacation with it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Ryan. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. Yeah.